Hi, everyone. Welcome to week two of Full Stack Deep Learning 2022. Today, we have a lecture on development infrastructure and tooling. My name is Sergey, and I have my assistant Mishka right here. So just diving right in, the dream of machine learning development is that you provide a project spec, identify birds, maybe some sample data. Here's what the birds look like. Here's what I want to see. And then you get a continually improving prediction system and it's deployed at scale. But the reality is that it's not just some sample data. You really have to find the data, aggregate it, process it, clean it, label it. Then you have to find the model architecture, potentially the pre-trained weights. Then you still have to look at the model code and probably edit it, debug it, run training experiments, review the results. That's going to feed back into maybe trying a new architecture, debugging some more code. And then when that's done, you can actually deploy the model. And then after you deploy it, you have to monitor the predictions and then you close the data flywheel loop, basically your users generating fresh data for you that, that you then have to add to your data set. So this reality has roughly kind of three components and we divide it into data in red, this development in yellow and deployment in green. And there are a lot of tools, like the infrastructure landscape is pretty large. So we have three lectures to cover all of it. And today we're gonna to concentrate on the development part, the middle part which is probably what you're familiar with from previous courses. Most of what you do is model development. We actually want to start even a little bit before that and uh, talk about software engineering. You know, it starts with maybe the programming language. And for machine learning, it's pretty clear. It has to be Python. And the reason is because of all the libraries that have been developed for it. It's just the winner in scientific and data computing. There have been some contenders. So Julia is actually the, the JU in Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. To write Python code, you need an editor. You can be old school and use Vim or Emacs. A lot of people just write in Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab, which also gives you a code editor window. VS Code is a very popular text editor. Python specific code editor, uh, PyCharm is, is really good as well. At FSDL, we recommend VS Code. It has a lot of nice stuff. It hasn't built, you know, in addition to the nice editing features, it has built-in Git version control. So you can see your commit. Uh, you can actually stage line by line. You can look at documentation as you write your code. You can open projects remotely. So like the window I'm showing here is actually on a remote machine that I've SSH'd into. You can lint code as you write. And if you haven't seen linters before, it's basically this idea that if there are code style rules that you want to follow, like a certain number of spaces for indentation, whatever you decide you want to do, you, gotta, you should just codify it so that you don't ever have to think about it or manually put that in. Your tools just do it for you. And if you run something that just looks at your code all the time, you can do a little bit of static analysis. So for example, there's two commas in a row. It's not going to run in this file or potentially you're using a variable that never got defined. And in addition, Python now has type hints. So you can actually say, you know, this variable is supposed to be an integer. And then if you use it as argument to a function that expects, expects a float, a static type checker can catch and tell you about it before you actually run it. So we set that all up in the lab, by the way, and you will see how that works. It's a very nice part of the lab. A lot of people, develop in Jupyter Notebooks. And they're really fundamental to data science. And I think for good reason. I think it's a great kind of first draft of a project. You just open up this notebook and you start coding. There's very little thought that you have to put in before you start coding and start seeing immediate output. So that kind of like fast feedback cycle, that's really great. And Jeremy Howard is a great practitioner. So if you watch the fast AI course videos, You'll see him use them to their full extent. They do have problems though. For example, the, the editor that you use in the notebook is pretty primitive, right? There's no refactoring support. There's no maybe peaking of the documentation. There's no copilot, which I have now got used to in VS Code. There's out of order execution artifacts. Uh, so if you've run the cells in a different order, you might not get the same result as if you ran them all in line. It's hard to version them. You either strip out the output of each cell, in which case 
you lose some of the benefit because sometimes you want to save the artifact that you produced in the notebook or the file is pretty large and keeps changing and it's hard to test because it's just not very amenable to like the unit testing frameworks and, and, and best practices that people have built up. Counterpoint to everything I just said is that you can kind of fix all of that. And that's what Jeremy Howard's trying to do with NB Dev, which is this package that lets you write documentation, your code and tests for the code all in a notebook. The full stack deep learning recommendation is go ahead and use notebooks, actually use the VS code built in notebook support. So I actually don't, I'm not in the browser ever. I'm just in, in my VS code, but I'm coding in a notebook style. But also I usually write code in a module that then gets imported into a notebook. And with this live reload extension, it's quite nice because when you change code in the module and rerun the notebook, that it gets the updated code. And also you have nice things like you have a terminal, you can look at files and so on. And by the way, it enables really awesome debugging. So if you want to debug some code, you can put a breakpoint here on the right, you see the little red dot. And then I'm about to launch the cell with the debug cell command. And that'll drop me in into the debugger at that breakpoint. And so this is just really nice. Without leaving the editor, I'm able to, to do a lot. Notebooks are great. Sometimes you want something a little more interactive, maybe something you can share with the world. And Streamlit has come along and let you just decorate Python codes. So you write a Python script, you decorate it with widgets and uh, data loaders and stuff. And you can get interactive applets where people can, let's say a variable can be controlled by a slider and everything just gets rerun very efficiently. And then when you're happy with your applet, you can publish it to the web and just share that Streamlit address with your audience. It's really quite great. For setting up the Python environment, it can actually be pretty tricky. So for deep learning, usually you have a GPU and the GPU needs CUDA libraries and Python has a version. And then each of the requirements that you use like PyTorch or NumPy have their own specific version. Also some requirements are for production like Torch, but some are only for development. For example, Black is a code styling tool or MyPy is a static analysis tool. And it'd be nice to just separate the two. So we can achieve all these desired things by specifying Python and CUDA versions in environment.yaml file and use conda to install the Python and the CUDA version that we specified. But then all the other requirements we specify in with basically just very minimal constraints. So we say like torch version greater than 1.7 or maybe no constraints like NumPy, any version. And then we use this tool called pip tools that will analyze the constraints we gave and the constraints they might have for each other and finds a mutually compatible version of all the requirements and then locks it so that when you come back to the project, you have exactly the versions of everything you used. And we can also just use a make file to simplify this. Now we do this in lab. So you'll see this um, in lab. And on that note, please go through labs one through three. They're already out and starts with an overview of what the labs are going to be about. Then PyTorch Lightning and PyTorch. And then we go through CNNs, transformers, and we see a lot of the structure that I've been talking about. So that is it for software engineering. And the next thing I want to talk about are specifically deep learning frameworks and distributed training. So why do we need frameworks? Well, deep learning is actually not a lot of code if you have a matrix math library like NumPy. Now, fast.ai course does this pretty brilliantly. They, they basically have you build your own deep learning library and, and you see how very little code it is. But when you have to deploy stuff onto CUDA for GPU powered deep learning, and when you have to consider that you might be writing weird layers that have to, you have to figure out the differentiation of the layers that you write, that can get to be just a lot to maintain. And so, and then also there's all the layer types that have been published in the literature, like the like convolutional layers, there's all the different optimizers. So there's just a lot of code 
And for that, you really need a framework. So which framework should you use, right? Well, I think Josh answered this, you know, pretty concisely about a year ago. And he said, Jax is for researchers, PyTorch is for engineers, and TensorFlow is for boomers. So PyTorch is the full stack deep learning choice. But seriously though, you know, both PyTorch and TensorFlow and Jax, they all are similar. You define a deep learning model by running Python code, writing and running Python code. And then what you get is an optim optimized execution graph that can target CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, mobile deployments. Now, the reason you might prefer PyTorch is because it just basically is absolutely dominant, right? So if you look at the number of models, trained models that are shared on Hugging Face, which is like the largest model zoo, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. You know, there's models that are both PyTorch and TensorFlow. There's some models on JAX. There's some models for TensorFlow only. There's a lot of models that are just for PyTorch. If you track paper submissions to academic conferences, it's about 75 plus percent PyTorch implementations of these research papers. And my face is blocking the stat, but it's something like 75% of machine learning competition winners use PyTorch in 2022. Now TensorFlow is, is kind of cool. TensorFlow.js in particular lets you run deep learning models in your browser and PyTorch doesn't have that. And then Keras as a development experience is I think pretty unmatched for just stacking together layers, easily training the model. And then there's JAX, which you might've heard about. So JAX, you know, the main thing is you need a meta framework for deep learning. We'll talk about it in a second, but PyTorch, that's the pick, excellent dev experience. It's people used to say, well, maybe it's a little slow, but it really is production ready even as is, but you can make it even faster by compiling your model with a Torch script. There's a great distributed training ecosystem. There's libraries for vision, audio, uh, 3D data, you know, et cetera. There's mobile deployment targets. And with PyTorch Lightning, which is what we use in labs, have a nice structure for how to kind of, where do you put your actual model code? Where do you put your optimizer code? Where do you put your training code, your evaluation code? How should the data loaders look like? And, uh, and then what you get is, if you just kind of structure your code as PyTorch Lightning expects it, you can run your code on CPU or GPU or any number of GPUs or TPUs with just you know a few characters change in your code. There's a performance profiler, there's model checkpointing, there's 16-bit precision, there's distributed training libraries. It's just all very nice to use. Now, another possibility is fast AI software, which is developed alongside the fast AI course. And it provides a lot of advanced tricks like data augmentations, better weight initializations, learning rate schedulers. It has this kind of modular structure where there's data blocks and learners, and then even vision text tabular applications. The main problem with it that I see is the code style is quite different. And in general, it's, it's a bit different than, than mainstream PyTorch. It can be very powerful if you go in on it. At FSDL, we recommend PyTorch Lightning. TensorFlow is not just for boomers, right? FSDL prefers PyTorch because we think it's a stronger ecosystem, but TensorFlow is still perfectly good. And if you have a specific reason to prefer it, such as that's what your employer uses, you're gonna have a good time. It still makes sense. It's not bad. Jax is a recent, a more recent project from Google, which is really not specific to deep learning. It's about just general vectorization of all kinds of code and also auto differentiation of all kinds of code, uh, including you know, physics simulations, stuff like that. And then whatever you can express in Jax gets compiled to GPU or TPU code and super fast. For deep learning, there are separate frameworks like Flux or Haiku. And you know, here at FSDL, we say, use it if you have a specific need. Maybe you're doing research on something kind of weird, that's fine. Or you know, potentially you're working at Google, and you're not allowed to use PyTorch. That could make it a pretty good reason to use Jax. There's also this notion of meta frameworks and model zoos that I wanna cover. So model zoos is the idea that, sure, you can just start with blank PyTorch, 
But most of the time, you're going to start with at least a model architecture that someone's developed and published. And a lot of the time, you're going to start with actually a pre-trained model, meaning someone trained the architecture on specific data. They got weights that they then saved and uploaded to a hub, and you can download and actually start not from scratch, but from a pre-trained model. Onyx is this idea that deep learning models are all about the same, right? Like we know what an MLP type of layer is. We know what a CNN type of layer is. And it doesn't matter if it's written in PyTorch or TensorFlow or CAFE, whatever it's written in, we should be able to actually port it between the different code bases because the real thing that, we're, that we care about are the weights and the weights are just numbers, right? So Onyx is this format that lets you convert from PyTorch to TensorFlow and vice versa. And it can work super well. It can also not work super well. You can run into some edge cases. So if it's something that you need to do, then definitely worth a try. But it's not necessarily going to work for all types of models. Hugging Face has become an absolutely stellar repository of models, starting with NLP, but ha have since expanded to all kinds of tasks, audio classification, image classification, object detection, there's 60,000 pre-trained models for all these tasks. There is a specific library of transformers that works with PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX. Also 7.5 thousand data sets that people have uploaded. There's also a lot more to it. It's worth checking out. You can host your model for inference and there's, there's community aspects to it. So it's a great resource. Another great resource specifically for vision is, is called Tim. State-of-the-art computer vision models can be found on Tim. Just search Tim GitHub. Next up, let's talk about distributed training. So the scenarios are, we have multiple machines represented by little squares here with multiple GPUs in each machine. And you are sending batches of data to be processed by a model that has parameters, right? And the data batch can fit on a single GPU or potentially not fit on a single GPU. And the model parameters can fit on a single GPU or potentially not fit in a single GPU. So let's say the best case, the easiest case is your batch of data fits on a single GPU, your model parameters fit on a single GPU, and that's really called trivial parallelism. You can launch independent experiments on other GPUs. So maybe do a hyperparameter search, or potentially you increase your batch size until it can no longer fit on one GPU, and then you have to figure something else out. And what, then you, what you have to then figure out is, okay, well, my model still fits on a single GPU, but my data no longer fits on a single GPU, so now I have to go and do something different. And what that different thing is usually is data parallelism. It lets you distribute a single batch of data across GPUs and then average gradients that are computed by the model across all the GPUs. So it's the same model on each GPU, but different batches of data. Because a lot of this work is cross GPU, we have to make sure that the GPUs have fast interconnect, right? So GPUs connected usually through a PCI interface to the computer, but it, and so if there's no other connection, then all the data has to flow through the PCI bus all the time. It's possible that there is a faster interconnect like NVLink between the GPUs, and then the data can leave the PCI bus alone and just go across, straight across the, um, the fast interconnect. And the speed up you can expect is if you are using server cards like A100s, A6000s, you know, V100s, it's basically a linear speed up for data parallelism, which is really cool. If you're using consumer cards like 2080s or 3080s, we'll talk about it a little further down. Then, unfortunately, it's going to be a sublinear speedup. So maybe if you have four GPUs, it'll be like a 3x speedup. If you have eight GPUs, maybe a 5x speedup. And that's due to the, the fact that the consumer cards don't have as fast of an interconnect. So data parallelism is implemented in PyTorch in the distributed data parallel library. There's also a third-party library called Horovod, and you can use either one super simply using PyTorch Lightning. You basically say, what's your strategy? If you don't say anything, then it's single GPU. But if your strategy is DDP, then it uses the PyTorch distributed data parallel. If you use a strategy Horovod, then it uses Horovod. 
It seems like the speed up's basically about the same. There's no real reason to use Horovod over distributed data parallel, but it might make it easier for a specific case that you might have. So it's good to know about. But the first thing to try is just distributed data parallel. Now we come to a more advanced scenario, which is now we can't even fit our model. Our model is so large, it has billions of parameters, it doesn't actually fit on a single GPU. So we have to spread the model, not just the data over multiple GPUs. And there's three solutions to this. So sharded data parallelism starts with the question, what exactly is in the GPU memory? What has taken up the GPU memory? So, okay, we have the model parameters, the floats that make up our actual layers. We have the gradients. We need to know about the gradients because that's what we average to do our backdrop. But we also have optimizer states, and that's actually a lot of data for the atom optimizer. That's probably the most often used optimizer today. It has to be statistics about the gradients, basically. And in addition, if you're doing kind of float 16 training, then your model parameters and gradients might be float 16, but the optimizer will keep a copy of them as float 32 as well. So it can be a lot more data. And then plus, of course, you send your batch of data. So all of this has to fit on a GPU, but does it actually have to fit on every GPU is the question. So the baseline that we have is, yeah, let's send all of this stuff to each GPU. And that might take up like 129 gigabytes of data in this, in this example. This is from the paper called Zero Optimization Storage Training Trillion Parameter Models. Okay, so what if we shard the optimizer states? Sharding is a concept from databases where if you have one source of data, you actually break it up into shards of data such that across your distributed system, each part of your, each node only sees a shard, a single shard of the data. So here, the first thing we can try is we can shard the optimizer states. Each GPU doesn't have to have all the optimizer state. It just has to have its little shard of it. We can do the same for gradients, and that's called zero two. And then pretty crazily, we can also do it for the model parameters themselves and that's called zero three. And that can result in a pretty insane order of magnitude reduction in memory use, which means that your batch size can be 10 times bigger. I recommend watching this helpful video that I have linked, but you literally pass around the model params between the GPUs as computation is proceeding. So here we see four GPUs, four chunks of data entering the GPUs. And what happened is GPU zero had the model parameters for that first part of the model, and it communicated these parameters to the other three GPUs. And then they did their computation. And once they were complete with that computation, the other GPUs can actually delete the parameters for those first four layers. And then GPU one has the parameters for the next four layers, and it broadcasts them to the other three GPUs who are now able to do the next four layers of computation and that's just in the forward pass. And then you do the same with gradients and optimizer states in the backward pass. This is a lot to implement. Thankfully, we don't have to do it. It's implemented by the Deep Speed library from Microsoft and the Fair Scale library from Facebook. And recently, actually, also implemented natively by PyTorch. So in PyTorch, it's called fully sharded data parallel instead of 0, 3. And with PyTorch Lightning, you can actually try sharded DDP with just a tiny bit of a change, try it. See if you see a massive memory reduction that can correspond to a speed up in your training. Now the same idea, the zero three principle, right? Is that the GPU only needs the model params it needs in the moment for the computation it's doing at this moment. The same principle can be applied to just a single GPU. You can get a 13 billion parameters onto the GPU and you can train a 13 billion parameter model on a single V100, which doesn't even fit it natively. And uh, Fairscale also implements this and calls it CPU offloading. There's a couple more solutions. Model parallelism, take your model, your model let's say has three layers and you have three GPUs, you can put each layer on a GPU, right? And in PyTorch, you can just implement it very trivially, but the problem is that only one GPU will be active at a given time. 
So the trick here is that, and once again, implemented by libraries like DeepSpeed and Fairscale, they make it better. So they pipeline this kind of computation so that GPUs are mostly fully utilized. Although you need to tune the amount of pipelining and the batch size and exactly how you're going to split up the model into the GPUs. So this isn't as much of a fire and forget solution like, like sharded data parallel. And another solution is tensor parallelism, which basically is observing that there's nothing special about a matrix multiplication that requires the whole matrix to be on one GPU. You can distribute the matrix over GPUs. So Megatron LM is a repository from NVIDIA, which did this for the transformer model and is widely used. So you can actually use all of these if you really need to scale. And the model that really needs to scale is a GPT-3 sized language model, such as Bloom, which recently finished training. So they used zero data parallelism, tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, in addition to some other stuff, and they called it 3D parallelism. But they also write that since they started their endeavor, the, the zero stage three performance has dramatically improved. And if they were to start over again today, maybe they would just do sharded data parallel and that would just be enough. So in conclusion, you know, if your model and data fits on one GPU, that's awesome. If it doesn't, or you want to speed up training, then you can distribute over GPUs with distributed data parallel. If the model still doesn't fit, you should try zero three or fully sharded data parallel. There's other ways to speed up. There's 16 bit training. There's maybe some special, you know, fast kernels for different types of layers like transformers. You can maybe try sparse attention instead of normal dense attention. So there's other things that these libraries like deep speed and fair scale implement that you can try. And there's even more tricks that you could try. For example, for NLP, there's this position encoding step. You can use something called Alibi, which scales to basically all, all length of sequences. So you can actually train on shorter sequences and use this trick called sequence length warmup, where you train on shorter sequences and then you increase the size. And because you're using Alibi, it should not mess up your position encoding. And then for vision, you can also use a size warmup by progressively increasing the size of the image. You can use special optimizers. And these tricks are implemented by a library called Mosaic ML Composer. And they report some pretty cool speed ups and it's pretty easy to implement. And they also have a cool web tool. I'm a fan of these things that basically lets you see the efficient frontier for training models, time versus cost. Kind of fun to play around with this Mosaic ML Explorer. There's also some research libraries like FFCV, which actually try to optimize the data flow. There are some simple tricks you can maybe do that speed it up a lot. These things will probably find their way into mainstream PyTorch eventually, but it's worth giving this a try, if, especially if, again, you're training on vision models. The next thing we're going to talk about is compute that we need for deep learning. I'm sure you've seen plots like this from OpenAI. This is up through 2019, showing on a log scale just how many times the compute needs for the top performing models have grown. And this goes even further into 2022 with the large language models like GPT-3. They're just incredibly large and require an incredible amount of petaflops to train. So basically, NVIDIA is the only choice for deep learning GPUs. And recently, Google TPUs have been made available in the GCP cloud, and they're also very nice. And the three main factors that we need to think about when it comes to GPUs are how much data can you transfer to the GPU? Then how fast can you crunch through that data? And that actually depends on whether the data is 32-bit or 16-bit. And then how fast can you communicate between the CPU and the GPU and between GPUs? We can look at some landmark NVIDIA GPUs. So the first thing we might notice is that there's a, basically a new architecture every year, every couple of years. It went from Kepler with the K80 and K40 cards in 2014 up through Ampere from 2020 on. 
some cards are for server use, some cards are for consumer use. If you're doing stuff for business, you're only supposed to use the server cards. The RAM that the GPU has allows you to fit a large model and a meaningful batch of data on the GPU. So the more RAM, the better. These are, this is like kind of how much data can you crunch through in a unit time. And there's also, I have a column for Tensor T-flops, which are special Tensor cores that NVIDIA specifically intends for deep learning operations, which are mixed precision, float 32 and float 16. These are much higher than just straight 32-bit teraflops. If you use 16-bit training, you effectively double or so your RAM capacity. And we looked at the teraflops, these are theoretical numbers, but how do they actually benchmark? Lambda Labs is probably the best source of benchmark data. And here they show relative to the V100 single GPU, how do the different GPUs compare? So one thing we might notice is the A100, which is the most recent GPU, that's the server grade, is over 2.5 faster than V100. You'll notice there's a couple of different A100s. The PCIe versus SXM4 refers to how fast you can get the data onto the GPU. And the 40 gig versus 80 gig refers to how much data can fit on the GPU. Also recently, there's RTX A4000, 5000, 6000, and so on cards, and the A40. And these are all better than the V100. Another source of benchmarks is AIME. They show you time for ResNet 50 model to go through 1.4 images in ImageNet. The configuration of four A100s versus four V100s is three times faster in, in Flow32 and only one and a half times faster in Flow16. There's a lot more stuff you can notice, but that's what I wanted to highlight. And uh, we could buy some of these GPUs. We could also use them in the cloud. So Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure are all the heavyweight cloud providers. Google Cloud Platform out of the three is special because it also has TPUs. And the startup cloud providers are Lambda Labs, Paperspace, CoreWeave, DataCrunch, Jarvis, and others. So briefly about TPUs. So there's four versions of them, four generations. The TPU v4 are the most recent ones, and they're just the fastest possible accelerator for deep learning. This graphic shows speedups over A100, which is the fastest NVIDIA accelerator. But the V4s are not quite in general availability yet. The V3s are still super fast, and they excel at scaling. So if you, use, if you have to train such a large model that you use multiple nodes, multiple, and all the cores in a TPU, then this can be quite fast. Each TPU has 128 gigs of RAM. So there's a lot of different clouds and it's a little bit overwhelming to actually compare prices. So we built a tool for cloud comparison, cloud GPU comparison. So we have AWS, GCP, Azure, Lambda Labs, Paperspace, Jarvis Labs, DataCrunch, and we solicit pull requests. So if you know another one like CoreWeave, make a pull request to this CSV file. And then what you can do is you can filter. So for example, I wanna see only the latest generation GPUs. I wanna see only four or eight GPU machines. And then maybe particularly, I actually don't even wanna see the, I wanna see only the A100s. So let's only select the A100s. So that narrows it down, right? So if we wanna use that, that narrows it down. And furthermore, maybe I only want to use the 80 gig versions. So that narrows it down further. And then we can sort by per GPU price or the total price. And we can see the properties of the machines, right? So we know the GPU RAM, but how many virtual CPUs and how much machine RAM do these different providers supply to us? So now let's combine this cost data with benchmark data. And what we find is that something that's expensive per hour is not necessarily expensive per experiment. Using Lambda Labs benchmarking data, if you use the 4X V100 machine, which is the cheapest per hour, and you run an experiment 
using a transformers model that takes 72 hours, it'll cost 1750 to run. But if you use the 8X A100 machine, it will only take eight hours to run and it'll actually only cost $250. And there's a similar story if you use ConvNet instead of transformer models. Less dramatic, but still we find that the eight by A100 machine is both the fastest and the cheapest. So that's a little counterintuitive. So I, I was looking for more benchmarks. So here is Mosaic ML, which I mentioned earlier. They're benchmarking the ResNet 50, and this is on AWS. What they find is the 8X A100 machine is one and a half times faster and 15% cheaper than 8X V100. So this is a ConvNet experiment. And here's a transformer experiment, GPT-2 model. So the 8X A100 machine is twice as fast and 25% cheaper than the 8X V100 machine. And it's actually three times faster and 30% cheaper than the 8X T4 machine, which is a Turing generation GPU. A good heuristic is use the most expensive per hour GPU, which is probably going to be a 4X or 8X A100 in the least expensive cloud. And from playing with that cloud GPU table, you can convince yourself that the startups are much cheaper than the big boys. So here I'm filtering by A100s and the per GPU cost on Lambda Labs is only $1.10 per hour. And on GCP, Azure, and, and AWS, it's at least you know $3.67. But what if you don't want to use the cloud? There's two options. You could build your own, which is, I would say, easy. Or you can buy pre-built, which is definitely even easier. Lambda Labs builds them, NVIDIA builds them, and then just PC builders like Supermicro and stuff like that build them. You can build a pretty quiet PC with, with a lot of RAM and let's say, you know, two 390s or 2080 Ti's or something. That would maybe be five to $8,000. It'd take you a day to build it and set it up. Maybe it's a rite of passage for deep learning practitioners. Now, if you want to go beyond four 2000 series like 2080s or two 3000 series like 3090s, that can be painful just because there's a lot of power that they consume and they get hot. So pre-built can be better. Here's a $12,000 machine with two A5000s, which each have 24 gigs RAM. It's gonna be incredibly fast. Or maybe you want A GPUs. Now this one is gonna be loud. You're gonna to have to put it in some kind of special facility like a colo. And actually Lambda Labs can, can store it in their colo for you. It'd be maybe $60,000 for eight A6000s which is a really, really fast server. Lambda Labs also provides actionable advice for selecting specific GPUs. There is a well-known article from Tim Detmers that is now slightly out of date because there's no Ampere cards, but it's still good. He talks about more than just GPUs, but also about what CPU to get, the RAM. So the recommendations that, that I want to give is I think it's, it's useful to have your own GPU machine just to shift your mindset from minimizing cost of running in the cloud to maximizing utility of having something that you already paid for and just maximizing how much use you get out of it. But to scale out experiments, you probably need to enter the cloud and you should use the most expensive machines in the least expensive cloud. TPUs are worth experimenting with if you're doing large scale training. Lambda Labs is a sponsor of the full stack deep learning projects that our students are doing this year. It's actually an excellent choice for both buying a machine for yourself and it's the least expensive cloud for A100s. Now that we've talked about compute, we can talk about how to manage it. So what we wanna do is we wanna launch an experiment or a set of experiments. Each experiment is going to need a machine or machines with GPU or GPUs in the machine. It's gonna need some kind of setup like a Python version, CUDA version, NVIDIA drivers, Python requirements, like a specific version of PyTorch, and then it needs a source of data. So we could do this manually. We could use a workload manager like Slurm. We could use Docker and Kubernetes, or we could, we could use some software specialized for machine learning. If you follow best practices for specifying dependencies like 
Conda and pip tools that we covered earlier, then all you have to do is log into the machine, launch an experiment, right? Activate your environment, launch the experiment, say how many GPUs it needs. If you, however, have a cluster of machines, then you need to do something more advanced, which is probably going to be Slurm, which is an old school solution to workload management that's still, that's still widely used. This is actually a job from the big science effort to train the GPT-3 sized language model. So they have 24 nodes with 64 CPUs and eight GPUs on each node. Slurm is the way that they launched it on their cluster. Docker is a way to package up an entire dependency stack in, in something that's lighter than a full on virtual machine. NVIDIA Docker is also something you'll have to install, which lets you use GPUs. And we'll actually use this in lab, so we'll talk more about it later. Kubernetes has kind of emerged as, as the best way, the most popular way to run many Docker containers on top of a cluster. Kubeflow specifically is a project for machine learning. Both of these are Google originated open source projects, but they're not controlled by Google anymore. So with Kubeflow, you can spawn and manage Jupyter notebooks. You can manage multi-step workflows. It interfaces with PyTorch and TensorFlow. And you can run it on top of Google Cloud Platform or AWS or Azure or on your own cluster. And it can be useful, but it's a lot. So it could be the right choice for you, but we think it probably won't be. Slurm and Kubeflow, they make sense if you already have a cluster up and running, but how do you even get a cluster up and running in the first place? And before we proceed, I try not to mention software as a service that doesn't show pricing. I find that, you know, when you go to the website and it says, call us or whatever, contact us for a demo, that's not the right fit for the FSDL community. We like to use open source ideally, but if it's not open source, then at least something that's transparently priced. AWS SageMaker is a solution you've probably heard about if you've used Amazon Web Services. And it's really a set of solutions. It's everything from labeling data to launching notebooks, to training, to deploying your models, and even to monitoring them. And notebooks are like a central paradigm. They call it SageMaker Studio. And SageMaker could totally make sense to adopt if you're already using AWS for everything. If you're not already using AWS for everything, it's not such a silver bullet that it's worth adopting necessarily. But if you are, it's definitely worth a look. So for training specifically, they have some basically pre-built algorithms and they're quite, they're quite old school, but you can also connect any other algorithm yourself. It's a, little more, it's a little more complicated. And right away, you have to configure a lot of IAM you know, roles and, and security groups and stuff like that. It might be overwhelming if all you're trying to do is train a machine learning model. That said, they do have increasing support for PyTorch. Now notice if you're using SageMaker to launch your PyTorch training, you're gonna be paying about a maybe 15 to 20% markup. So there's special SageMaker instances that correspond to normal AWS GPU instances, but it's more expensive. They do have support for using spot instances and so that could make it worth it. AnyScale is a company from the makers of Ray, which is an open source project from Berkeley. And recently they released Ray Train, which they claim is faster than SageMaker. So the same idea basically lets you scale out your training to many nodes with many GPUs, but does it faster. And it has better spot instance support, where if a spot instance gets killed during training, it recovers from it intelligently. And any scale, any scale is software as a service that makes it, you know, really simple to provision compute with one line of code. You can launch a cluster of any size. That ease of use comes at a significant markup to Amazon Web Services. Grid.ai is makers of PyTorch Lightning. And the you know the tagline is seamlessly train hundreds of machine learning models on the cloud with zero code changes. If you have some kind of main.py method that's gonna run your training, and that can run on your laptop or on, on some local machine, you can just scale it out to a grid of instances by prefacing it with grid run, and then just saying what kind of instance type, how many GPUs, 
should I use spot instances and so on. And uh, you can also, you can use their instances or you can use AWS under the hood. And then it shows you all the experiments you're running and so on. Now, I'm not totally sure about the long-term plans for grid.ai because the makers of PyTorch Lightning are also rebranding as lightning.ai, which has its own pricing. So I'm, I'm just not totally sure, but it's, if it sticks around, it looks like a really cool solution. There's also non-machine learning specific solutions. Like you don't need SageMaker to provision compute on AWS. You could just do it in a number of ways that people have been doing, you know, provisioning AWS instances and then uniting them into a cluster. You can write your own scripts. You can use Kubernetes. You can use some libraries for spot instances, but there's nothing, you know, we can really recommend that's super easy to use. Determined AI is a machine learning specific open source solution that lets you manage a cluster either on-prem or in the cloud. It's cluster management, distributed training, experiment tracking, hyperparameter search, a lot of extra stuff. It was a startup also from Berkeley. It got acquired by HP, but it's still an active development. It's really easy to use. You just install Determined, get a cluster up and running. You can also launch it on AWS or GCP. That said, I feel like a truly simple solution to launching training on many cloud instances still doesn't exist. So this is an area where I think there's room for a better solution. And that cannot be said about experiment management and model management, because I think there's great solutions there. So what experiment management refers to is, you know, as we run machine learning experiments, we, we can lose track of which code parameters data set generated which model. When we run multiple experiments, that's even more difficult. We need to like start making a spreadsheet of all the experiments we ran and the results and so on. TensorBoard is a solution from Google that's not exclusive to TensorFlow. It gives you this nice set of pages that lets you track your loss and see where your model saved. And it's a great solution for single experiments. It does get unwieldy to manage many experiments as you get into dozens of experiments. ML flow tracking is a solution that is open source. It's from Databricks, but it's not exclusive to Databricks. It's not only for experiment management. It's also for model packaging and stuff like that. But they do have a robust solution for experiment management. You do have to host it yourself. Weights and biases is a really popular, super easy to use solution that is free for public projects and paid for private projects. They show you all the experiments you've ever run, slice and dice however you want. For each experiment they record, what you log, like your loss, but also stuff about your system, like how utilized your GPU is, which is pretty important to track. And you basically just initialize it with your experiment config, and then you log anything you want, including images. And we're actually gonna see this in lab four, which is this week. They also have some other stuff like you can host reports and tables is a recent product that lets you slice and dice your data and predictions in really cool ways. Determined.ai also has an experiment tracking solution, which is also perfectly good. And there's other solutions too, like Neptune and Comet and a number of others really. Often we actually want to programmatically launch experiments by doing something that's called hyperparameter optimization. So Maybe we want to search over learning rates. So as we launch our training, we don't want to commit to a specific learning rate. We basically want to search over learning rates from, you know, 0 0.0001 to 0 0.1. It'd be even more awesome if like this was done intelligently, where if multiple runs are proceeding in, in parallel, the ones that aren't going as well as others get stopped early and we get to search over more of the potential hyperparameter space. Weights and biases has a solution to this that's very pragmatic and easy to use. It's called sweeps. The way this works is you basically add a YAML file to your project that specifies the parameters you want to search over and, and how you want to do the search. So here on the right, you'll see we're using this hyperband algorithm, which is the state of the art hyperparameter optimization algorithm. And then you launch agents on whatever machines you control. The agent will pull the sweep server 
for a set of parameters, run an experiment, report results, pull the server for more parameters, and keep doing that. And there's other solutions. This is pretty table stakes kind of thing. So SageMaker has hyperparameter search. Determined AI has hyperparameter search. I think of it as just, it's a part of your training harness. So if you're already using weights and biases, just use sweeps from weights and biases. If you're already using Determined, just use hyperparameter search from Determined. It's not worth using some specialized software for this. And lastly, there are all-in-one solutions that cover everything from data to development to deployment. The single system for everything, for development, usually a notebook interface, scaling a training experiment to many machines, provisioning the compute for you, tracking experiments, versioning models, but also deploying models and monitoring performance, managing data, really all in one. HMaker is the, you know, the prototypical solution here. But there's some other ones like Gradient from Paperspace. So look at, look at these features, notebooks, experiments, data sets, models, and inference. Or Domino Data Labs, you can provision compute, you can track the experiments, you can deploy a model via a REST API, you can monitor the predictions that the, that the API makes, and you can publish little data applets, kind of like Streamlit. You can also monitor spend, and you see all the projects in one place. Domino's meant more for kind of non-deep learning machine learning, but I just wanted to show it because it's a nice set of the all-in-one functionality. So these all-in-one solutions could be good, but before deciding we want to go in on one of them, let's wait to learn more about data management and deployment in the weeks ahead. And that is it for development infrastructure and tooling. Thank you.